The Savage Tales of Solomon Cain by Robert E. Howard The Right Hand of Doom And he hangs at dawn, ho ho! The speaker smote his thigh resoundingly and laughed in a high-pitched grating voice. He glanced boastfully at his hearers and gulped the wine which stood at his elbow. The fire leaped and flickered in the taproom fireplace and no one answered him. Roger Simeon the necromancer! sneered the grating voice. A dealer in the diabolic arts and a worker of black magic, my word. All his foul power could not save him when the king's soldiers surrounded his cave and took him prisoner. He fled when the people began to fling cobblestones at his windows and thought to hide himself and escape to France. Ho, ho, his escape shall be at the end of a noose. A good day's work, say I. He tossed a small bag on the table where it clinked musically. The price of a magician's life, he boasted. What say you, my sour friend? This last was addressed to a tall, silent man who sat near the fire. This man, gaunt, powerful, and somberly dressed, turned his darkly pallid face towards the speaker and fixed him with a pair of deep, icy eyes. I say, said he in a low, powerful voice, that you have this day done a damnable deed. Yon necromancer was worthy of death belike, but he trusted you, naming you his one friend, and you betrayed him for a few filthy coins. Methinks you will meet him in hell some day. The first speaker, a short, stocky, and evil-faced fellow, opened his mouth as if for an angry retort, and then hesitated. The icy eyes held his for an instant and the tall man rose with a smooth cat-like motion and strode from the taproom in long, springy strides. Who is Yom? asked the boaster resentfully. Who is he to uphold magicians against honest men? By God, he's lucky to cross words with John Redley and keep his heart in his bosom. The tavern keeper leaned forward to secure an ember for his long stem pipe and answered dryly. And you be lucky too, John, for keeping that mouth shut. That be Solomon Cain, the Puritan, a man dangerouser than a wolf. Redley grumbled beneath his breath, muttered an oath, and suddenly replaced the money bag in his belt. Are you staying here tonight? Aye, Redley answered suddenly. Rather I'd stay to watch Simeon hang in talk at town tomorrow, but I'm London bound at dawn. The Daffin keeper filled their goblets. Here's to Simeon's soul, God have mercy on the wretch, and may he fail in the vengeance he swore to take on you. John Redley started, swore, then laughed with reckless bravado. The laughter rose emptily and broke on a false note. Solomon Cain awoke suddenly and sat up in bed. He was a light sleeper as becomes a man who habitually carries his life in his hand, and somewhere in the house had sounded a noise which had roused him, he listened. Outside, as he could see through the shutters, the world was whitening with the first tints of dawn. Suddenly the sound came again, faintly. It was as if a cat were clawing its way up the wall outside. Cain listened, and then came a sound as if someone were fumbling at the shutters. The Puritan rose, and sword in hand, crossed the room suddenly and flung them open. The world lay sleeping to his gaze. A late moon hovered over the western horizon. No marauder lurked outside his window. He leaned out, gazing at the window of the chambers next to his. The shutters were open. Cain closed his shutters and crossed to his door, went out into the corridor. He was acting on impulse as he usually did. These were wild times. This tavern was some miles from the nearest town, Talkertown. Bandits were common. Some one or something, had entered the chamber next to his, and its sleeping occupant might be in danger. Cain did not halt to weigh pros and cons, but went straight to the chamber door and opened it. The window was wide open, and the light streaming in illuminated the room, yet made it seem to swim in ghostly mist. A short, evil-visaged man snored on the bed, and he Cain recognised as John Redley, the man who had betrayed the necromancer to the soldiers. Then his gaze was drawn to the window. On the sill squatted what looked like a huge spider. 
and as Cain watched, it dropped to the floor and began to crawl towards the bed. The thing was broad and hairy and dark, and Cain noted that it had left a stain on the window sill. It moved on five thick and curiously jointed legs, and altogether had such an eerie appearance about it that Cain was spellbound for the moment. Now it had reached Redley's bed and clambered up the bedstead in a strange, clumsy sort of manner. Now it poised directly over the sleeping man, clinging to the bedstead, and Cain started forward with a shout of warning. At instant Redley awoke and looked up, his eyes flared wide, a terrible scream broke from his lips, and simultaneously the spider thing dropped, landing full on his neck. And even as Cain reached the bed, he saw the legs lock and heard the splintering of John Redley's neck bones. The man stiffened and lay still, his head lolling grotesquely on his broken neck, and the thing dropped from him and lay limply on the bed. Cain bent over the grim spectacle, scarcely believing his eyes, for the thing the which had opened the shutters crawled across the floor and murdered John Redley in his bed was a human hand. Now it lay flaccid and lifeless, and Cain gingerly thrust his rapier point through it and lifted it to his eyes. The hand was that of a large man, apparently, for it was broad and thick with heavy fingers, and almost covered by a matted growth of ape-like hair. It had been severed at the wrist and was caked with blood. A thin silver ring was on the second finger, a curious ornament, made in the form of a coiling serpent. Cain stood gazing at this hideous relic as the tavern keeper entered, clad in his night shirt, candle in one hand and blunderbuss in the other. What's this? he roared as his eyes fell on the corpse on the bed. Then he saw what Cain held spitted on his sword, and his face went white. As if drawn by an irresistible urge, he came closer. His eyes bulged. Then he reeled back and sank into a chair, so pale Cain thought he was going to swoon. "'God's name, sir!' he gasped. "'Let that thing not live! There be a fire in the taproom, sir!' Cain came into Talker Town before the morning had waned. At the outskirts of the village he met a garrulous youth who hailed him. "'Sir, like all honest men, you will be pleased to know that Roger Simeon the Black Magician has hanged this dawn, just as the sun came up.' "'And was his passing manly?' asked Cain somberly. "'Aye, sir, he flinched not. But a weird deed it was. "'Look ye, sir, Roger Simeon went to the gallows with but one hand to his arms.' "'And how came that about?' Last night, sir, as he sat in the cell like a great black spider, he called one of his guards and, asking for a last favour, bade the soldier strike off his right hand. The man would not do it at first, but he feared Roger's curse, and at last he took his sword and smote off the hand at the wrist. Then Simeon, taking it in his left hand, flung it far from the bars of his cell window, uttering many strange and foul words of magic. The guards were sore afraid, but Roger offered not to harm them, saying he hated only John Redley that betrayed him. And he bound the stump of his arm to stop the blood, and all the rest of the night he sat as a man in a trance, and at times he mumbled to himself as a man that unknowingly talks to himself. And to the right, he would whisper, and bear to the left, and on, on. Oh, sir, it was grisly to hear him, they say, and to see him crouching over the bloody stump of his arm. And as dawn was grey, they came and took him forth to the gallows, and as they placed the noose about his neck, sudden he writhed and strained as if with effort, and the muscles in his right arm, which lacked my hand, bulged and creaked as though he were breaking some mortal's neck. Then as the guards sprang to seize him, he ceased and began to laugh, and terrible and hideous his laughter bellowed out until the noose broke it short, and he hung black and silent in the red eye of the rising sun. Solomon Cain was silent, for he was thinking of the fearful terror which had twisted John Redley's features in that last swift moment of awakening and life, ere doom struck, and a dim picture rose in his mind, that of a hairy, severed hand crawling on its fingers like a great spider, blindly through the dark night-time forest to scale a wall and fumble open a pair of bedroom shutters. Here his vision stopped recoiling from the countenance of that dark and bloody drama. What terrible fires of hate had blazed in the soul of the doomed necromancer, and what hideous powers had been his to send the bloody hand groping on its mission, guided by the magic and will of that burning brain. Yet to make sure, Solomon asked, 
And was the hand ever found? Nay, sir, men found the place where it had fallen when it was thrown from the cell, but it was gone, and a trail of red led into the forest. Doubtless a wolf devoured it. Doubtless, answered Solomon Cain. And were Simeon's hands great and hairy with a ring on the second finger of the right hand? Aye, sir, a silver ring coiled like unto a snake.